more common. So I thought what we would do is um, go over the basics on hip and knee replacement and then talk a little about what's changed and why, you know, when your grandmom had a hip replacement 20 years ago, she uh, or she went to a rehab facility and stayed in the hospital for a week and stayed in the rehab facility for a couple of weeks. But now um, your mom or dad are actually going home the same day. So uh, we'll get to it. So we're going to talk a little about hip replacement first. And the anatomy is always important in, in surgery. We always talk about anatomy. So the hip the joint is the top part of your femur and the bottom part of your pelvis. So your femur is your thigh bone. The ball on top of your femur is the femoral head. And that's the ball of the ball and socket joint. And then the socket is the pelvis right here. And that articulates to, um, to create your hip joint. So osteoarthritis is a very common condition. It's a wear and tear condition that deteriorates the cushion in your joints. If we go back, what you see here is all this pink stuff that's covering the top of the femoral head. That represents cartilage. When cartilage rubs on cartilage, that's a smooth surface rubbing on a smooth surface, and that allows you to move without pain. So arthritis is damaged cartilage, uh, where you lose the cartilage. And how does it develop? You can develop from abnormal anatomy. Maybe you had a problem with your hip as a kid. Uh, abnormal biology. Maybe you have a problem with blood flow to your hip. Overuse um, or even genetics. You know, your mom and dad had hip replacements. Uh, your brother had a hip replacement. And now you need a hip replacement as well. So um, all different ways that we can develop arthritis. And so what causes pain is, is in, again, in that healthy hip, you have cartilage rubbing on cartilage. In the diseased hip, you have cartilage breakdown, which leads to bone on bone contact. So I really liken it to a door hinge. So here's your brand new house, brand new door hinge. It's like healthy cartilage, well lubricated, has full motion and is pain free. Over a lifetime, you know, normal function is something we take for granted. You can walk, get out of a car, exercise, sleep, and just not really have pain. That can change. And now you get this, jo this joint or this door hinge. And this door hinge is damaged cartilage. It's loss of lubricating mechanism, loss of motion, pain. It creaks, it cracks, it makes noises. And that's the best way I can, I can give an, an, a simple analogy for arthritis. And so when we talk about hip pain, we ask patients, do they sometimes limp? Is it difficult to perform like simple tasks like walking or housework? Or the big one is putting on socks or tying shoes. That's a really common sign that you could have something wrong with your hip. Uh, does pain limit your activities and your lifestyle? Do the legs feel different in length? Balance problems. Most people with hip arthritis have uh, pain in the thigh, the groin, or the buttock. And does pain radiate to the knee? Um, that's another common complaint of hip pain. Or hip arthritis, excuse me. So how can you treat it? You don't need surgery if you have hip arthritis, at least not right away. You can treat it with water therapy, soaking, hot packs, aqua therapy. Exercise and physical therapy are good for weight loss. Medications like anti-inflammatories, Motrin, Tylenol, and even steroid injections can be done in the hip, usually under some type of ultrasound or image-guided therapy. Uh, hip replacement is a good procedure when you've kind of exhausted the non-operative treatment methods. Basically, what it does is it replaces the damaged surfaces. It helps to relieve pain and improve mobility. Um, pretty common in 2009, about 300,000 were done in this country. Probably now we're up to four or 500,000 a year. Uh, at the Rothman Institute, we do about eight or 9,000 a year. Um, so what is a hip replacement? Basically, you have this picture from the beginning, this normal anatomy. And what we do is we cut the bone right here at what's called the femoral neck. We take this bone and we throw it away. And then what we do is we put a metal stem inside of the femur bone, a metal shell in, the, in the, that socket to recreate the socket. And then we put a ball on top of the stem to articulate with the socket. And that's now your new ball and socket joint. So here's a preoperative x-ray. You've got a, you got a femoral head with no, it's bone on bone right here. There's cysts, there's sclerosis or hardening or whitening of the bone. These are all the findings of arthritis. And then here's the replaced hip. So the metal is white on an x-ray. So you have a metal shell or cup recreating your socket. You have a metal stem inside the femur. And on top of that metal stem is a ball that's actually articulating with a plastic liner. And so one way that we do hip replacements at the Rothman Institute is we do what's called an anterior approach. And what that is, is classically, if you see people with hip replacements, they'll have incisions on the side or back of their hip. 
when we work from the front of the hip, we can go between muscles and tissue without detaching them from the hip, from the hip to thigh bone or without cutting muscle. And that allows us to get into the hip joint um, and hopefully cause less soft tissue damage. So here's the picture, a kind of a classic hip replacement of patients lying on their side and the surgeon will have to go through the side or the back and detach muscle and disrupt tissue. With an anterior approach, what we do, uh, or I do it at Capital Health Hospital is we have this torture device called a HANA table and the patients don't worry, they're, they're, they're under anesthesia when they're on this so they don't feel their legs being manipulated. Um, and what happens is when we go via an anterior approach, we can get in with, to the joint without damaging muscle or, or tissue. And then we can also use an x-ray in surgery to check component position and also leg length during the procedure to minimize complications. So hip replacement is a great procedure, no matter how you have it, posterior, lateral, anterior, most patients are very glad they did it. And most patients do very well, 97, 96% successful. It's been dubbed the operation of last century because it, it's simply just so successful and it has grown exponentially in volume since its development in the 1960s. So in summary, regarding the hip, the leading cause of hip pain is osteoarthritis. It's a degenerative condition that'll get worse over time and not better. Uh, it's really important to get an early diagnosis and use the non-operative treatments. Believe it or not, all you need to diagnose is physical exam and x-ray. You don't need an MRI. You don't need a bone scan. You just usually need a standing x-ray. And we can always do that right in the office. Um, hip replacement is a great procedure if you have bad hip arthritis to help relieve pain and improve mobility. And, you know, your surgeon is going to choose the right approach and implant for you. So really important to start out treatment early with a surgeon you trust and kind of move from there. Um, I'll take, I'll look at these six questions, Kristen, and let's see, we got a knee one. I'm just seeing if they were, yeah. So here's one about, um, about the hip. Uh, someone's a cyclist and they began to experience pain in the groin five months ago. The hip x-ray showed moderate to severe damage in the right hip and moderate in the left. Uh, who would you suggest I see in Center City? Um, Kristen, maybe you can take that one. We have a lot of great surgeons in Center City. Um, does bone on bone rubbing cause problems besides pain or bleeding that would be a health risk? No, not really. That's a great question, David. Um, bone on bone is really just gonna cause pain. You're not gonna have any other uh, real issues with there. Um, anesthesia question, that's a pretty common one. Most of the time, about 95% of the time. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, we do what's called a spinal anesthetic. So you get a needle in the back and you're numb below the waist for surgery. And then if you want to be, you know, asleep during surgery, you just tell anesthesia and they give you like a couple of margaritas and you just take a nap and you wake up in the recovery room. But in theory, since they're doing the anesthesia with essentially local or spinal anesthetic, you could be awake during the procedure. But by doing it via spinal, it's actually a little easier to do the surgery for the surgeon. It's also safer for the patient. There's a lower risk of blood clot, stroke, heart attack, and pneumonia if you do a spinal, as opposed to general anesthesia where they put a tube down your throat. So we'll go on to uh, knee arthritis. The knee is the uh, biggest joint in the body. It's made up of uh, three main bones, the tibia, the shin bone, the femur, the thigh bone, and the patella, the kneecap. In between these bones all through here is cartilage and that allows the knee to move smoothly with range of motion. Again, arthritis is one of the most common causes of knee pain as we age. Uh, it's a wear and tear condition. Again, that cartilage deteriorates and that causes bone on bone contact and pain, swelling and dysfunction. It, just like hip arthritis, it's a degenerative condition that over time won't get better, will probably get worse. So um, here's an arthritic knee. It should be like a white surface like this, Instead, it's, there's kind of damage to the white surface and it kind of goes all the way down to the bone. So here's a knee right here um, with space between the femur here and the tibia here. And then here's a knee that's bone on bone. See the femur is touching the tibia right here. That's a pretty common pattern of arthritis. So when we talk about knee pain, we ask our patients, you know, how often does your knee hurt? Does it hurt more than one day a week? Does it interfere with sleep? Is it difficult to walk more than a block? Do pain medications help? Um, has inactivity from knee pain caused you to gain weight? These are all questions we'll ask patients. And a lot of times the answer is, is, is negative in those answers. So how can we treat knee arthritis without surgery? You can do water therapy, heat, just like they have heat, ice, um, aqua therapy, exercise and physical therapy. Weight loss is really important. Believe it or not, 
Studies show that even for people who are just 10 or 15 pounds heavy overweight in their 20s, they're about three times more likely to get a knee replacement in their 50s. So knee replacement uh, can absolutely be very well correlated with weight. So it's really important to have a healthy weight. Um, medications, uh, anti-inflammatories, steroids can all help. Um, injections like steroids um, and, and the hyaluronic acid. It's got like 50 different names, gel, chicken rooster, comb, uh, honeycomb, orthovis, synvis, uh, supart. There's all these different names, but they're all the same. So don't let anyone try to tell you it's new. Basically what it is, it's synthetic joint fluid that you can inject into the knee joint. It decreases inflammation just like steroids and it can also lubricate the joint. So I liken those injections to um, uh, WD-40 for the knee. Oftentimes they're given once a week for three weeks, but sometimes you can get uh, different formulations. So when the non-operative treatments fail, when you just, you know, when you can't live with it anymore and you have difficulty functioning, a knee replacement's a great idea. Um, that number 580,000 is probably old. We're probably closer to a million knee replacements at this point uh, in the United States every year. Great procedure that helps restore the damaged surfaces and helps relieve pain and restore mobility. So here's what a knee replacement looks like. So here's a model of a bone here, right? So you got this metal component that sort of sits on the end of the femur and you got a metal component that sort of sits on top of the tibia and then a piece of plastic in between. And here's what it looks like on an X-ray. So here's this metal white thing on the femur, metal white thing on the tibia. And then the black here is the plastic. The plastic is radio opaque, so it doesn't really show up on X-ray other than its shape here. So again, a healthy knee right here with space between the femur and the tibia and then a knee replacement, very similar to the last slide. So in summary, the leading cause of knee pain is osteoarthritis, which is a degenerative condition. Usually won't get better, will probably get worse over time. Early diagnosis and treatment for knee replacement is important. People can be managed for years with anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, and injections. So really important to you know, not ignore your body when you're having pain, get that diagnosis, and treat your knee pain um, you know, as, as you need it. Um, so, and, and yeah, knee replacements, a great surgery too, very successful um, and become more and more common uh, in the United States and in all over the world. So what can you expect after a joint replacement? What about the hospital stay? Well, that's going to be very, you know, some people don't even need to go to a hospital. They can go to a, a surgery center. Uh, some people will stay in the hospital one night and go home the next day. And that's the majority of people. They're either going to go home the same day or the next day. A small percentage of patients, you know, maybe they're older, sicker, have other medical issues, may require a hospital stay that's more than one night. Recovery. So everybody's, everyone asks, Doc, what's the recovery like? And everybody's different um, in how they define it. So with knee or hip replacement, you know, the goal is, is that you have the surgery and then you walk or and or stand that day. Um, so, you know, you're not lying down, you're not laid up, you can walk and stand that day. And the goal is you just keep walking and standing more and more as time goes on until you get back to normal. It can take anywhere from, you know, two to four weeks to even, you know, two to four months. Everybody's a little different. I can tell you that hip replacement's usually a little easier to recover from the knee replacement. Um, all patients have stiffness, soreness, swelling, uh, sometimes trouble sleeping. So it can be challenging. And that's why I recommend that people take three months out of work if they're considering a hip or knee re replacement. Um, when we talk about you know, getting patients to mobilize quickly, um, we talk, you know, the key is really pain and nausea control. People aren't gonna get up out of bed if their pain and nausea aren't controlled. So we do a lot with medications to try to help with that. Physical therapy is really key for, especially you know, right after surgery. That we see, we have therapists at our surgery centers and at the hospital that come see the patients and help them get out of bed safely and you know answer their questions. Like, oh, oh, like you know, I have three steps to get in the house and then I have a thing I got to stand over to get into my shower. And these are like the ergonomic things that the therapist can really help patients with. Hip replacements, for the most part, once they leave the surgical facility, don't really need much in the way of physical therapy. They can just walk usually. Knee replacements oftentimes will need to go like work with a physical therapist. Um, you know, on a, you know, two or three time a week basis for the first six weeks. And then return to work is a big one too. Um, that, that answer has changed a lot. Um, COVID has enabled a lot of people to work from home. And so if you feel, you know, reasonable, uh, reasonably okay, you're not nauseous, you're not vomiting, you're, um, you know, you're getting sleep, it's reasonable to go back to work just a couple of weeks after surgery, if you're going to be able to work remote, or even if you have a desk job, like a, a banker or something like that. Now, if you're in construction, 
uh, maybe you, you work in a kitchen, something like that. That's going to be tougher, you know, standing on your feet all day. That's going to take maybe three months to get back to work. Um, so it just kind of varies based on what your expectations are and what your occupation is. So outpatient joint replacement becoming more and more common. And that was sort of the title of this talk. So what is it? Basically, this is exactly what it says. It is outpatient service. So you go in in the morning, you have your hip or knee replacement, and you go home the same day. And why is it more common now? Well, it's more common now because we're what's probably changed the most in the last decade or so of, of doing hip and knee replacement is the way that we care for patients. So we're doing all these little things to help patients mobilize and get up faster after surgery. So they don't need the time. They don't need to stay in a hospital overnight or two nights or go to a rehab for three weeks. So that's one reason it's really more common is because we can do it. 10 years ago, this would have been crazy. Um, but now this is very common to a point where actually it, at Capital Health, about 30% of our joint replacement patients go home the same day. Uh, at the Rothman Institute, I think we're about the same. And our target goal long term is 40 or 50% of patients go home the same day. And so then the next question is, well, am I a candidate? And, you know, that's going to vary based on medical problems, right? So if you're somebody who really doesn't have any health problems, yes, you're most likely a candidate. If you're somebody that has a bad deformity of their knee, uh, and may need revision type implants and have multiple medical comorbidities, no, you're probably not a candidate. So best to really review it with your physician. You know, every surgery center, every hospital has slightly different protocols, but overall the themes are about the same. And so one of the keys with um, outpatient joint replacement is safety. Um, we really strive to educate our patients. We have an educational packet that I feel is very manageable. It's just a few sheets of paper that patients can read and understand what to expect. Um, the next key is patient selection. So the am I a candidate part. So we want low risk patients. We want, um, we don't want them to be too heavy. We don't want them to be smoking. We don't want them to be anemic. We want if they have diabetes for that to be well controlled. So these are all things we can do to kind of find out, hey, who might be a candidate to go home the same day. Um, the other key really is, you know, infection prevention uh, and instrument cleaning, things like that, as we change site of surgery. So a lot of surgeries are not being done at a hospital. Now. They're being done at outpatient centers or specialty hospitals. We want to make sure that patients have the same opportunity to have a good outcome in these other facilities, too. So we really copy all the protocols that we developed in the hospital and bring them over. So if anybody has had surgery or knows someone who has, we still, you know, we'll do the nasal swabs, the Hibiclens wipes, all those things that kind of decrease bacterial load and risk to the patient. Um, and really, again, you know, if you're going to go home the same day after surgery, you really have to be self-motivated. You have to prepare yourself. Um, the coat, you know, the surgeon almost acts like a coach at some point, but it's good to have another person that's with you kind of on a daily basis or every other daily basis, who's like a caregiver and a coach to kind of help you and encourage you. You know, the goal I have is that when I show up in the morning to do my surgery and I say, ask the patient, do you have any questions? My goal is that the patient does not have questions because I have answered their questions and thus there's less they don't know and they're more prepared and thus more likely to succeed. You know, that fear of the unknown, you know, am I gonna have pain that's so bad that I can't control it? Am I gonna be dependent on others? When can I get back to driving? When can I get back to work? When will I feel normal? That's, you know, the fear. That's why uh, it's a scary thing, all justifiable concerns. But if we can kind of educate and prepare ourselves, we can kind of unknow a lot of those answers and, and really be a little more positive and, and um, certain before the surgery. Um, so when we talk about outpatient joint replacement, pain control is really key. And so we do a lot of things before surgery during surgery and after surgery to help with pain. Um, and, and, and before surgery, we'll give medications, uh, different types of medications, anti-inflammatories, anti-nerve medications, narcotics even. Um, and then intraoperatively, we do injections in surgery uh, in the joint capsule, usually numbing medications. Uh, we can do nerve blocks, which can really help just alleviate pain for the first 24 to 36 hours after surgery. And then after surgery, kind of the same as before surgery, we'll do anti-inflammatories, we'll do uh, steroids, we'll do um, anti-nerve medications or even muscle relaxers. And, you know, we try to limit the narcotics, but usually people will get like one prescription for like 20 or 30 pills of Vicodin. And that's reasonable for kind of big breakthrough pain. Um, so again, the big thing about outpatient joint replacement is, is working with physical therapy. So I send a lot of patients to therapy before surgery if I think they need it. Um, for the medical equipment that you might need, maybe a commode or walker, we can plan ahead, but usually the facility will get those things for you. 
Uh, we have the physical therapist come see you in the pre-op area. And then if you have steps, you don't need to worry about that. We actually have practice steps in our, uh, our, our kind of same day discharge area at the hospital and also in our surgery center. So we can train you how to go up and down steps before you leave, which is certainly helpful as a lot of us have steps in our houses. So the one, number one question I get after all these talks is how can I prevent a joint replacement? And the two ways are to stay active and control your weight. Um, exercise, physical activity are really a good thing for your joints. If you have some early or moderate knee arthritis, I tell everybody, you know, your best bet is an exercise bike. Um, it's going to allow you to exercise the joint without loading weight on it, like running or jogging or walking on a treadmill is. Um, and then weight control. There really is a direct correlation between how much people weigh and the incidence of knee arthritis. So really important to maintain a healthy weight um, really all the time, um, but also, you know, around the perioperative period as well. So if you're someone who was diagnosed with knee arthritis, you know, three weeks ago, it's a good time to, you know, kind of take a look in the mirror, work on the diet, work on the exercise to really try to just get yourself in the best shape possible. And uh, that, that was all I had. Um, so I'm going to look through the questions. And I do apologize. There is a, a femur fracture at the trauma center that I have to get to. Um, uh, uh, these things happen, you know, usually at four o'clock on a beautiful day. <laughs> um, so uh, let me see if I can answer some questions. Um, I had a knee replacement on my right knee, but it still hurts. Um, Rothman did an x-ray and thought it was loose and it needs to be re replaced. Probably that means revised. Um, that can happen. You know, these, these procedures are 96, 97% successful. That does tell you there's about a three or so percent failure rate. And one of the things that can happen is your implant, uh, however it's fixed to your bone, whether it's in a knee or a hip, can loosen. And that can cause pain and dysfunction and usually requires another surgery. Um, so that's un an unfortunate complication, but it's not common, but it does happen. Uh, when will the scar be healed? Um, uh, Lourdes, it's nice to see you. Um, the scar usually takes about four to five weeks uh, to completely heal. Um, so you have to give that a little bit of time. Um, but uh, the scars usually aren't, aren't too bad. I, I tell all my patients they're going to look great in a bathing suit. Um, someone scheduled for a hip replacement, would the need to go up 11 steps preclude outpatient surgery? Um, no, it would not. I think one thing you may want to consider is just talking to a physical therapist one time before your surgery, and you can tell them that and they can kind of work with you. The nice thing about their physical therapists is they can really customize things for each patient in their situation. So that, uh, that is not um, something that would negate you from outpatient surgery. Where is Rothman on the use of robotics for hip and knee replacement and advanced fully autonomous efforts such as monogram? Uh, Rothman, we have a lot of technology. We actually study it for some of the companies. Um, what we have found thus far is robotics has not proven to be more beneficial than kind of traditional or what we call manual surgery. We think there's promise there in some way, shape or form. So we continue to explore with it, um, but it definitely is not the standard of care, but it certainly is becoming more common. Um, as, far as, as far as fully autonomous efforts like monogram or uh, think surgical, um, think surgical is actually new. It's been around for about 20 years. They really haven't shown uh, an improvement in outcomes. Um, so it's hard to say that these things are worth the extra cost to a facility, uh, but certainly worth researching. Uh, typical recovery for a hip replacement, somewhere between, you know, four and 12 or 16 weeks. Um, most patients after a hip replacement will walk into the office four weeks after surgery, not on narcotics, hopefully with a cane or even nothing at all. But again, everybody's a little different. Um, how long before being able to drive on an average knee replacement? I'll take that for hip or knee. There have been some you know, evidence-based studies done on that question. Usually it's about two weeks for breaking time to uh, return to normal. So I always tell people, look, you gotta be careful. You gotta make sure you're safe. You can get from the brake to the gas and vice versa. And also police officers don't like it if you drive while taking narcotics, so you shouldn't be taking narcotics. Uh, next is, what's treatment for stress fracture on a lateral proximal femur in the femoral diaphysis? Unfortunately, that is a situation we sometimes see, and if you know non-weight bearing for a stress fracture doesn't work, sometimes a hip replacement or even a rod down the whole femur may be what someone needs with that diagnosis. Is there any wear and tear on the knee replacements? Yes, there can be wear and tear on the hip or knee replacements. Usually the metal will last pretty well. There are cases where the metal can actually break. 
Um, the bigger issue really is the plastic. The plastic can wear out and thin over time. And that's why, you know, we, we used to think, one of the reasons we used to think these things would only last, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years was because the plastic wasn't machined very well. In the last two decades, that has gotten a lot better. So we're seeing patients last longer and longer. A uh, question about robotic versus standard. I think I kind of mentioned that before. Um, do you use cement or is it press fit? Most hips in this country are done via press fit, meaning you're taking an implant and kind of shoving it into the bone and allowing the bone to grow into the implant, uh, with a, which has a roughened surface. And probably the other way, most knees are cemented, but you can also do a press fit knee as well. Um, depends on the patient, depends on the surgeon. Um, both uh, techniques work for the hip and the knee. Um, physical therapy can be aggressive. I mean, ideally, I tell patients and therapists, it shouldn't, you know, bring a patient to tears, but you do need to work, um, especially with the knee. It can be tough. Uh, straighten, I tell people, look, there's three things you got to do to recover from a knee replacement. Straighten the knee, bend the knee, and walk, but it can be much easier said than done. Um, anesthesia, I think we talked earlier that, yeah, most of the time a spinal anesthetic would be used for a knee or hip replacement. Uh, what percentage of patients have a reaction to the components? Very rarely do we see that. Um, there is, some people will have an allergy to like cheap jewelry or metal or cheap gold. Those patients are often allergic to nickel. And so there are some different types of implants we can use to avoid nickel, but pretty rare to see like a reaction or rejection of the implant. Um, a new knee replacement, a plastic piece will go between the two new parts. Why can't a plastic piece be inserted between the arthritic bones? Frank, it's funny you asked that question. Um, they, they tried to do that a few years ago and it failed miserably. And here's why. You can't just stick the plastic piece between the two bones because there's nothing holding it there. So what would happen is a phenomenon known as spin out. And what would happen is this plastic piece would go between the femur and the tibia and then because there wasn't anything holding it there, it would spin out, meaning it would go outside of the joint. And then it would cause problems because people would have trouble walking and there'd be this piece of plastic floating around their knee. Um, so that's why that doesn't work. Um, scar formation uh, risk with lack of compliance with physical therapy. No, I mean, you're gonna get a scar. We're taking a knife to your skin. Um, some patients can get a hypertrophic scar and you know can key, are tip prone to keloiding. Um, hard to predict that unless they'd had that before, but the scar doesn't, I don't think correlate very much with your therapy. Um, next was, is it not a good idea to have bilateral knees at the same time? I think it's a terrible idea because it hurts. Um, it's a really tough thing to go through. The patients really struggle. Additionally, we see patients having more complications when they get anemic. Um, and you more commonly, if you're having two surgeries, there's a higher risk of getting anemic. So I really don't do uh, bilateral simultaneous knee replacement anymore, um, just because I think it's really hard for the patients and it's a higher risk. Uh, my concern with knee replacement is getting addicted to pain medicine and infection of the knee. How does Rothman go about preventing these two concerns? We've done a lot of research in this. We actually have an opioid foundation doing research on this. Um, really one of the keys with uh, helping patients not getting addicted to pain medicine is not prescribing it that much. So that's a key. We pay a lot of attention to that. A lot of, um, a lot of laws have actually helped doctors kind of prescribe smarter and, and ways to avoid a pain medicine addiction. Additionally, we use different types of medications, which I mentioned earlier, like anti-inflammatories, anti-nerve medications, muscle relaxers, and nerve blocks that can help the, uh, alleviate the need for those meds as well. As far as infection, we all do so many things to prevent infection because it's a terrible complication. Uh, the infection rate's probably down around 0.25 or 0.5%. So at this point, if you get an infection, you're just unlucky. Now, it is important to optimize patients to make sure that uh, they, you know, any risk factors like poorly controlled diabetics, open wounds on the foot are kind of taken care of before surgery to decrease the risk of infection. Um, but, you know, that's not the case for most patients. Um, can you have a joint replacement if you're on blood thinners? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, we just have protocols with, depending on the blood thinner you're on, as far as when to stop the blood thinner before surgery. And we always recommend you, you discuss that with your primary care or who, physician or whoever's prescribing that medication. Uh, Zarelto, yes, you can have a knee replacement when you're on Zarelto. We are Penn State. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, hip pain seems to be causing knee pain. That can absolutely happen. So the best thing you need to do at that point is A, get a physical exam, B, get an x-ray. 
And then C, um, I sort of the hip and the knee. And then C, you can um, actually get injections in the hip and the knee and just try to figure out almost like a science experiment, you know, where the pain is coming from. What's the pain generator? Some people, the pain generator is both. Um, and eventually you need to get both joints done. Um, I already have a stiff knee from previous surgeries. Um, is it possible to get more flexion after replacement? It's possible, but really the big thing about range of motion after surgery is the number one predictor is your range of motion before surgery. So a stiff knee before surgery is probably going to be stiff after. Maybe you'll get plus 10 degrees of range of motion, maybe even minus. So it's not going to, I always tell patients, you know, the knee or hip replacement are not going to make your knee feel like you, it was when you were 30 or 40 or 50 years old. Um, but if we can get the joint to function reasonably well without pain, that's the goal. Um, let's see. Um, okay, opinion on nerve ending treatment, turn it into hip replacement. Yes, that's called ablation therapy. You can absolutely try that for the hip or the knee. I was involved in a study on nerve ablation therapy. Um, it does seem to work. The, the nerves seem to regenerate, so it, it probably isn't permanent, but certainly something that's worth trying. Um, Someone has knee arthritis and walks daily six to nine miles. Certainly, I think I encourage activity, so I think that's a fine thing to do. It may also be good for your knees to try to modify some of that walking and maybe do some exercise, uh, bicycles or um, even outdoor bicycles or um, an elliptical, just to kind of take the load off the knees at times. Uh, someone had shots in the knees yeah. about a month ago, still having pain. Um, yeah, it would be reasonable to go back to your doctor and talk about other options. Um, after knee replacement, how soon can you bicycle? That's actually a really good question because we actually have the therapist work with you on an exercise bike. Um, that's really one of the best ways to recover after a surgery. I would say though, you know, for risk of falling and then damaging things, I'd probably tell you to wait at least a month before bicycling out, bicycling outside. Um, as far as flying after hip or knee replacement, you can, I mean, people fly all over the world to get their surgeries and then leave, you know, a day later. It's certainly something you can do whenever you want. There is a risk you're taking that you may be at slightly higher risk to develop a blood clot. Um, the other concern I have for patients is, well, if you get your surgery and then you go to Florida the next day, and then you call me with a problem post-op day 10, I can't help you because I can't see you in Florida. So that can be a problem. Uh, but it's not, if you, if you had to go on a flight or if you have a trip planned six weeks later, it's probably okay. Um, if you have a torn labrum in the hip, that's a soft tissue structure between the bones, would, that, would a hip replacement help that? It would, because we cut out the, hip the labrum in a hip replacement. Um, but you wouldn't want to do a hip replacement unless you had arthritis. Uh, someone sent in a question about pain behind the kneecap. Is there any other procedure for me that, other than a total knee? Yes, we do partial knee replacements, um, and you may be a candidate for it, uh, so you would need to um, get the appropriate x-rays. Usually that's all you need. Uh, sometimes an MRI might be helpful um, to decide if you're a candidate for a partial knee replacement. Uh, will you be able to sit on the floor cross-legged during yoga after a hip or a knee? The answer is, could you do it before the surgery? And if you could, the answer is maybe. If you couldn't, the answer is no. All these questions you're answering and you have to see a patient too. You're busy. Yes, I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> we're all busy. That's a good thing. That's good, we can help people. Do tendons need to be sacrificed for knee surgery? Uh, no, no tendons need to be sacrificed in a knee surgery. Um, in knee replacement though, the ACL does have to be removed in almost every, using almost every implant. Um, and uh, sometimes the posterior cruciate ligament as well. Can you have a hip replacement if you had a stroke? Yes, you can, but you know, we wanna talk to your neurologist, we wanna talk to your medical doctor, we wanna make sure it's safe. A um, couple of thank yous. That's very kind. So glad you guys were here. Uh, water aerobics. Absolutely. Great idea to exercise in the water. Low resistance and you can still get a great cardiovascular workout and get your muscles worked. Can you run after a hip or a knee replacement? The answer is yes, but the better question is, could you do it before the hip or knee replacement? If you couldn't, the answer is no. If you could do it before, then the answer is yes, it's possible. The only concern with running is that you can, um, you can damage the plastic pieces uh, or you can help them wear out faster. So it's just a risk you take. Uh, treatment for bursitis you know, is actually similar to the non-operative treatment for hip or knee arthritis. Anti-inflammatories, therapy, um, injections, those things can help bursitis. Uh, bursitis is not related to arthritis. Um, it is a different condition. 
think I got to the bottom of them, Kristen. There's a couple at the top. Oh, at the top. A few Let's more see. Um, I did um, that one. I did that one. On did... Uh, there's, what's these the ones? treatment for stress fracture on lateral yeah, We talked about that. Femur. That uh, it could oh. be a hip replacement. It could be a rod in the femur, but usually the first step is not operative, depending on the pattern. But that is a problem we sometimes see. And did you see the one that I got cortisone shots in both knees about a month ago and still having pain? Should I go back for a series of injections? Yes, I recommended that patient go talk to their doctor. A series of uh, gel injections could be helpful. Okay, can you have a hip replacement if you've had a stroke? You can, yes. Uh, just got to get clearance from your neurologist. And yeah, I think we got everything. Yes, so, I think you got all of them. I want to thank you guys all for attending. Kristen, thanks so much for um, uh, hosting for us. Um, I do apologize. I was a little rushed. Um, I do have to get back to the hospital. Um, but, you know, really the key here, I, the thing I want you to take from this is you don't have to live in pain. Um, if you're having pain, you're having dysfunction, give us a call. Kristen will give you a hotline to call. Um, get in, get an x-ray, know what you have, know the non-operative treatment options. I can tell you, you know, we usually, the most doctors in our practice will see 40 to 50 patients a day, only three or four of them need surgery. So just because you come to us doesn't mean you need surgery, but we want to get you in case you do eventually need a surgery, we want to get you in the best shape possible for it. So you have a good outcome. Um, that was all I had. Okay, thank great. You. And if you guys, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions in, in the chat, I have my email and my phone number. I can help you get scheduled. I'll, I can connect you with our VIP scheduler, just answer um, any other questions you may have. Thanks, guys. Thanks, right, Thank you so much, Dr. Saxena. We Bye, appreciate guys. it. Bye.